Asteroid City does not exist. Those are the first words we hear at the very beginning of Wes Anderson's newest movie titled Asteroid City. So, if Asteroid City doesn't exist, what does? Over the next hour and 45 minutes, we were at least on the surface level, treated to Anderson's, as most people online like to say now, most Wes Anderson movie yet. You know, the usual suspects. Symmetry, deadpan delivery, stop motion, pastel colors, miniatures, bold typeface, classics, and grief. Most importantly, grief. Beyond all of the style and craftsmanship, there is always grief. Far and above the others, grief. Whether it be three estranged brothers grieving their dead father, a lobby boy grieving his mentor, and more importantly, his true love, or a homely private school teacher grieving her ex-husband, grief has always had a part to play in Wes's work. Even if it's not in your face, or in most cases, stated outright, you can feel it. It permeates his films. You stay away from my children. Do you understand? My God, I haven't been in here for years. Hey! Are you listening to me? Yes, I am! I think you're having a nervous breakdown. I don't think you recovered from Rachel's death. I... And Asteroid City is no different. In the play within the movie, Augie Steenbeck and his family are grieving the death of his wife. But if you pull back a layer, the actor playing Augie, Jones Hall, is actually grieving the death of his lover and confidant, the writer of Asteroid City itself, Conrad Earp. So in turn, we have grief informing grief. And we see scenes of this, like when Augie burns his hand on the griddle and Midge responds like she's breaking character, like she really didn't know he would do it. In a later scene during its climax, we see Augie, or more aptly at this point, Jones Hall, burst through the doors backstage, holding his burnt hand carefully. And in one of the funniest and most poignant moments, he overhears the alien character played by Jeff Goldblum say that he plays it like a metaphor. And he asks, a metaphor for what? What was this all for? What does it all mean? And more importantly, why does any of it matter if the ones you love most are gone? In Anderson's rawest scene, maybe in any of his films, Jones Hall goes out and talks to the actress who plays his dead wife in the play. And they talk about everything, questioning everything. But that's not the scene that I want to talk about. No one said I want to talk about the one right before it. In it, we see his character rush to the director, played by Adrian Brody, unsure about everything, afraid of living in his character's grief because he can't accept his own. And this is where I want to pull back the final layer of grief and talk about Wes as the director, and more specifically, the death of the artist. By now, Anderson's work is seen almost like a parody of itself. I mean, you have TikTok trends where people try to imitate their day to look like his style of work, which often fail terribly, and don't get me started on the AI attempts at his style. Whether he intended it or not, Wes Anderson is more than a director or an artist. It's now his brand. He's a genre of himself. So back to that same scene, Jones Hall says, I still don't understand the play. And the director responds with, Doesn't matter. Just keep telling the story. You're doing them right. Asteroid City is Anderson's most vulnerable film to date, I think at least. It questions what it means to create art, and if that art means anything in the long run. I think this was his response to the critiques you always hear, like style over substance, or back to what I said before, the most Wes Anderson movie. In that way, he is, maybe metaphorically, grieving the death of the artist himself. Grief takes time. But in the words of the great Adrian Brody, just keep telling the story. You're doing him right. The black and white framing device of Asteroid City provides the narrative of the play with context, specifically context surrounding queer creatives and their anxieties embedded within their art. Conrad Earp, the playwright, is gay, 
and lives his life in part through his art. His study features homoerotic nude paintings of cowboys, while the play itself involves a romance subplot between a shy female teacher and a charming cowboy. As a playwright myself, I find my characters having conversations that are about myself or my life in some way, so I believe it's safe to think that parts of the play are conversations Conrad is having with himself. On the darker side of things, Midge's script is about suicide. And in her life, she chooses her art in lieu of relationships with other people, namely her kids and the men in her life who have physically and emotionally hurt her. Juxtapose this with the idealistic dialogue of Dr. Hickenlooper, who longs for a protege. And when Woodrow states, this is our chance to be worthwhile for once in our lives, Hickenlooper pulls him aside and assures him it's all worthwhile, providing him with hope. It's as though with Midge, the playwright is confessing something about himself, while with Dr. Hickenlooper, he is imparting his advice to those worried about creating a legacy. A more obvious example of characters living through their art is Schubert Green, the director. He lives backstage for the duration of Asteroid City's production, and in his introductory scene, his wife asks him for a divorce. He is seen boxing the air for some reason, and upon second viewing, the reason is clear. There is a punching bag stationed in the right of the frame, with the title of the play he was in, The Welterweight. Schubert punches the air instead of punching the actual bag, as a show that he lives through fantasy instead of living through real life. He states he can't be in a room with real windows, a cryptic piece of dialogue that implies some sort of suicidal ideation. While it is not made explicit that Schubert is queer, his interactions with Conrad and Jones Hall, the actor, imply some sort of deep intimacy between the men. Namely, when Schubert enters the room for the play of workshop, Conrad reaches up his hand and the two grasp and continue to hold hands, maintaining contact throughout the scene, and suggesting a close relationship between playwright and director. This informs a queer reading of the narrative of the Asteroid City play itself, the cast of strange characters search for connection with each other. Augie Seenbeck lives through the lens of his camera, while Midge lives through her scripts. There's an anxiety as they speak with each other, as though they're not supposed to, or as though they're about to be discovered. Woodrow dances around admitting his crush on Dinah until Act 3, where he projects their initials on the moon and they kiss. Then there's the school teacher who tries over and over again to deliver her lessons and stick to the script, but is ultimately caught off guard by Montana, the cowboy, much in the same vein as Conrad's first interaction with Jones Hall, the actor, who enters Conrad's study against his wishes, feeds him his favorite ice cream, and delivers an inspiring monologue before the scene ends with the two of them kissing as canon and D major plays, traditionally a song played at weddings. Ultimately, Jones, the actor, doesn't understand the play, perhaps because he is unfamiliar with grief and thus cannot use that to play his character. He is living the play every night as he states that his real heart keeps getting broken as he performs. He seeks guidance from Schubert, and Schubert gently instructs him that it's okay not to understand. The great irony is that Conrad dies six months into the run of the play. Once Conrad dies, one can only assume that Jones has the capacity to finally understand the play, relating the grief of his lost lover to the relatively heteronormative narrative of Asteroid City. The great question that sticks with me is whether Conrad's death is an accident or suicide. The crash is not described as a car accident, leaving the details ambiguous. In the play, Augie and Midge read a script where Augie asks why Midge's character killed herself and tells her there's so much left to see. She replies, slumped over the bathtub, that she's already seen it. This sentiment sits heavy with the viewer. Is this a line meant to express Conrad Earp's ennui? Or is this a statement that's meant to be wrestled with and ultimately resolved through some narrative means? Does the introduction of the alien from the vast cosmic wilderness somehow disprove that someone could possibly have seen everything? Is the alien a reason to continue living? An unexpected visitor, much like Jones was when he arrived in Conrad's study, carrying his favorite ice cream. This fascination with death and dying runs throughout the play. And one has to wonder, if Conrad did not die by suicide, 
then was he in fact doomed by his own narrative? Setting Jones up to mourn him as Aki mourns his wife. From a metatextual standpoint, it's as though Conrad left instructions for Jones that he wouldn't understand until after his death, writing in a scene cut from the play that Aki needs to move on and replace his wife, which in Jones's case would mean to replace Conrad. Overall, the Asteroid City film couches the heteronormative play within a queer narrative, wherein the play cannot be understood without the context of the queer men that helped create it, and in turn, the creators and actors cannot be understood without the lens of the play with its thesis on grief, death, alienation, and unlikely connection. In the censorship-riddled atmosphere of the 1950s when this film is set, the play cannot feature explicitly queer characters. So Wes Anderson adds the layer of the framing device to textually state the existence of the Asteroid City play's queer subtext. <laughs> Self-doubt is a prominent theme in Wes Anderson's latest feature, Asteroid City, a film I was worried would be very much more of the same going in, but thankfully, I was quickly proven wrong. Not only was the film rich with more substance and meta-commentary than any of his films before, but I left the theater choking back tears. Never until then had I connected that emotionally to a Wes Anderson film. I've seen folks over the years criticize Anderson as emotionally distant, or that his films have a cynicism to their emotional core. I disagree. It's not that he's scared to get vulnerable with the audience. I just think he connects to things differently than most folks, and it's expressed as such through his art. That being said, Asteroid City lays his heart bare. There are many different themes running throughout this film, and one of them is how the pandemic affected the artist. When the pandemic shut everything down, many folks suddenly had a lot more time on their hands when they sat at home. Artists felt disconnected during this time, and for many, it was hard to feel up to working on stuff, even if you could work on stuff at all. There was a lot of time to think and take a step back and reflect on your body of work and your journey as an artist. I believe this is, at least partially, what led to Asteroid City. Anderson has made 10 feature films up to this point, and nearly all of them have received a fair amount of critical success and have carved their notable placement in the zeitgeist. His distinct style is so well known and celebrated at this point that it's been poorly imitated on TikTok as a viral trend this year. And despite all of this, I believe Anderson's clear message from the film is that it doesn't matter how well cemented you are, how successful you've been, every good artist has moments of self-doubt there will always come that feeling of uncertainty, fleeting or not, that washes over one as they question why they even started doing what they're doing in the first place. We can see Anderson shake things up a bit in The French Dispatch, the film that was written and filmed right before the pandemic hit. Doing an anthology movie and using a fictional magazine company as a framing device and backdrop to deliver these short stories was a refreshing change of pace. But Asteroid City's framing device is much more important and interesting when looking at the bigger picture. For the most part, despite his heavy stylization, his films and stories and settings all still remain grounded in reality. This changes in Asteroid City, as this story takes place in a retro-futuristic version of the 1950s, in which there are death rays, projections on the moon, and casual detonations of nuclear bombs. It's very much trying to emulate the exaggerated pulpiness of the 1950s space race era. The aesthetic is like a postcard come to life. The biggest shock, however, is the crux of the story within the play, which centers on a UFO and the extraterrestrial creature that pilots it. This is a wild change for a live-action Wes Anderson film, as he's never delved into straight-up fantasy or science fiction. It kind of feels like that part of the reason he has this story told through a framing device is because it's the only way he can justify the ungrounded nature of the story to nobody but himself. It might be a reach, but it really feels like he wanted to mirror his own possible uncertainty as well as the validity of an artist through the creation of the playwright character Conrad Earp, who wrote the in-universe play Asteroid City itself. My friends touched on the grieving of the death of the artist, as well as the metamodernism and queer narrative of the film, so I'd like to touch on one more thing. 
There's so many different thematic events and imagery in this film, as it's really his most complex, so it can be overwhelming on the first watch to digest it all. But the main thing that stood out to me was that this was partially a pandemic film, as the whole second half was spent in quarantine. This is when the characters have a chance to figure some things out for themselves internally. It's only when the alien returns that Jones Hall realizes his character has worked some things out, but he still hasn't. And sometimes, you can't figure everything out on your own. And Hall has to talk to the director who knew the playwright Conrad well. And then, he goes out to the balcony and speaks to the woman who was supposed to play his wife in the play, who helps drive home the point that Conrad is not coming back. He's gone. So now, Jones can return to the play and give Augie the epilogue he deserves. After this sequence is a scene where Conrad Earp seeks help from the actual cast and crew of Asteroid City to help finish a scene that he just can't figure out. And this feels like a representation of Wes Anderson himself having a creative roadblock of some kind, or maybe a realization of complacency with his style or just the art form in general. There's a surrealist moment where some of the crew walk around like sleeping zombies, and one by one they pop up and say, you can't wake up if you don't fall asleep. This could be Anderson acknowledging that he got a second wind of sorts creatively, and perhaps that's the moment he crushes his self-doubt. I believe this film is very important to him for that reason. This scene brought tears to my eyes, because I've had so many creative roadblocks and forms of self-doubt, and several times I've had to give up on myself and break down who I thought I was as an artist and what I was trying to achieve with my own films before having a much needed rebirth of confidence and the desire to create. And sometimes it really can get hard, especially during that first year of COVID. The inclusion of the alien in this scene really solidifies that for me as it represents something so wild and different, an artistic risk to shock the system to wake you up. When Augie gets to have his epilogue at the end, it seems that Wes briefly comments on how quickly everything went back to normal after the quarantine in the film, and how if we do make contact with life outside this earth, there would probably be a bit of a hullabaloo for a minute, but things would probably go back to normal pretty quickly. Life goes on, you know? <laughs> 